And so in Philippians chapter 4, last week we had kind of just a review, I guess you would say, of the background of the book. Uh, and again, I'm not in a real rush to get through this book just because, you know, the book of Philippians is a really great book, a lot of great doctrine in here. So we are going to start getting into it uh, chapter by chapter, verse by verse. You say, well, you read chapter 4 tonight, or you had it read rather, you know, we left off in chapter 1. Well, if we're going to get there. So, you know, by the time we get around to chapter 4, you might have forgotten what was read tonight. So, unless you're, you know, you're getting into it yourself. But uh, we're going we're gonna to get there. I'm going to continue in the vein of last week a little bit. Last week, if you remember, we looked at the fact that uh, we looked at the place and the people of Philippi. We looked at Acts chapter 16, how that's very uh, closely tied into um, the book of Philippians. You see a lot of the characters that were there. Lydia, uh, the, the, the young maiden who was possessed with the devil the Philippian jailer, so on and so forth. So that's a real, uh, you know, Acts 16 is a real, gives us a lot of background into the, the, the people and the place of Philippi, which is, of course, you know, where the church of, of the Philippians is. And we saw how that they were, uh, the people there, basically the kind of the thrust, the message was that we saw from Acts chapter 16 that the people that were in Philippi were, uh, you know, they had advantages being a chief uh, city of the Romans. Uh, people have said it was like a, a, they called it the mini Rome or something like that. It was a smaller version of Rome, but it was a very chief city. It was located in a place where there was a lot of commerce. There was a lot of wealth. There was a lot of the economy was strong. Lydia was a good example of that. The fact that she had a home that could host the church. She was a seller of purple, which is a very expensive garment. You know, dyed garments were very expensive. We saw also that, you know, just logically because of the fact that if she's making purple, obviously somebody's buying it. And we saw that they were a very open-handed church. They were very liberal in their giving. Uh, and, and Paul made mention of that in chapter 4, where we read tonight, and he even mentioned it to the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians chapter 8. And the kind of the thrust, again, last week was we saw how much the Philippians invested of their substance in, in, the, in the gospel and how we should do that. You know, we might not have uh, the affluence that they have. We might not have the resources that they have. But the one thing that we all do have is time, right? And that's the most valuable thing that we all, any of us have. That's our most precious asset. So that was kind of last week. I don't want to spend a lot of time on that. But I'm going to look a little bit more tonight, just kind of do an overview of the book itself and just point out some things. And one of the things is that we might want to look at is the fact is, why is Paul even writing this book? You ever open up a book of the Bible, one of the epistles, and say, well, why did he even write this? You know, and I'm sure there were other epistles that Paul may have written that we don't even know about, but, you know, God saw fit that the book of Philippians was there for us. So let's look, first of all, tonight, and we're going to be mainly in Philippians. We're going to, we're going to do some flipping around at the end, so stick with me, but we're going to be mainly in Philippians throughout the book. But Paul had several reasons for writing this book, I believe, and one of them was uh, this relationship between uh, the Philippian people and uh, Epaphroditus. If you remember, he's a major character in the book of Philippians, this man, Epaphroditus. And I believe it was through him that the Philippians learned of Paul's imprisonment because there was this back and forth with Epaphroditus. We see that in the book of Philippians. He's coming and going a few times that we know of. Um, and through him, the Philippian people learn about his imprisonment. And you look there in Philippians chapter 1, you see that it says in verse 29 of Philippians chapter 1, verse 29, for unto you it is given in the behalf of Christ not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for his sake, having the same conflict which ye saw in me. So Paul had some kind of conflict when he was there with the Philippian people, right? That's where we know from Acts 16 that he was jailed, he was beaten, so on and so forth. They saw that conflict. And now here to be in me. So not only they see a conflict there, but now they have heard of another conflict. That conflict being that he is now in prison again. He's writing to them from Rome. And how did they hear about that? They heard that from this man, Epaphroditus. We see, in, if you want to go to Philippians chapter 4, that the Philippians had sent Epaphroditus to Paul with an offering. It says in Philippians chapter 4, verse 10, But I rejoiced in the Lord greatly, that now at the last the care, your care of me hath flourished again, wherein you were also careful, but ye lacked, lacked opportunity. Verse 18, so he's talking about his, their care for him, right? Uh, meaning, you know, how, how they wanted to, to, to give to him. They gave him an offering, it says here in verse 18. But I have all and abound, for I am full, having received of Epaphroditus the things which were sent from you. So we see that Epaphroditus has gone to them. Hey, Paul's in jail. And the Philippians have said, take this offering to Paul and take care of him with it. 
And it says that uh, he had, having received a paphrodite, the things which were sent from you, an odor of, sweet, of a sweet smell, a sacrifice acceptable, well-pleasing to God. So we can see here, Epaphroditus is this guy that is communicating between Paul and the Philippian church. And, you know, it, it stands to reason that Epaphroditus is a Philippian. That he, that's where Paul probably uh, got to know him. <clears throat> and then what we also see here concerning Epaphroditus is the concern that the Philippian church had for him. You know, they had this, this deep concern for him. It says in verse 25, Yet I supposed it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother, and my companion in labor and fellow soldier. So that's a pretty, uh, you know, those are some good titles to have. You know, would to God that it could be said of us, that, that, that a man like Paul might say something like that of us, or that Christ would say that of us, you know, that we are his companion in labor, that we are a fellow soldier, Right? but your messenger, and that he ministered to my wants, for he longed after you all. So why is Epaphroditus longing after the Philippian people? And he was full of heaviness, because that ye, because that ye had heard that he had been sick. So Epaphroditus, you can see this, this mutual concern between Epaphroditus and the Philippian people. He, they're, they're saying, oh man, Epaphroditus is sick, and they're concerned about him. And Epaphroditus, I mean, this guy what a, must be just a, a real tender-hearted guy. I mean, because he's saying he was concerned that they heard that he was sick. I don't know that I've ever done that. <laughs> I never, you poor thing, I'm sorry I concerned you that, that I got sick. You know, uh, I'm usually turned into a big blubbering baby, you know. Help me, uh, you know. Yeah, anyway, he says in verse 27, For indeed he was sick nigh unto death. So, He's upset that they're upset about how sick he was. But God had mercy on him, and not him only, but on me also, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. So you can kind of see this, this care, this loving care between Paul, Epaphroditus, and the Philippians. And, you know, I don't know, I don't know maybe this is just uh, this is the impression I've gotten over the years, is that I think people, sometimes they think Paul's just kind of was kind of a hard case. I don't know if everyone's ever any felt like that. I remember when I would read the, the epistles, I'm like, man, this Paul, I mean, he's a godly man, right? He, he's, God's, he's God's man. He's preaching. He's doing what he's got to do. But sometimes, you know, he's saying things that are pretty rough, right? And I know I've read some of the things, like, ouch, Paul, <laughs> really? And he stepped on my toes. But then you see passages like this, which reminds us that Paul is a very tenderhearted man, you know, and it, it's a, he does everything out of his love for the Lord and his love for people. Because it says there, he was, he was sick, nigh unto death, but God had mercy on him, and not on him only, but on me also. He's saying, if Paphroditus had gone, my fellow laborer, my fellow soldier, your messenger, you know, that would have brought sorrow upon me too. Showing us that Paul would have been very upset had Epaphroditus gone. Lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. He's saying, it's bad enough, you know, I'm here in prison, so on and so forth. Please, you know, it's, at least God had mercy, he didn't take Epaphroditus from me. And it goes to show us when people are going through hard times, you know, companionship goes a long way. When people are going through a hard time in their life, like Paul's going through here, you know, those relationships that we might otherwise take for granted become very valuable, don't they? You think about, you know, preachers that are, go through some kind of persecution. You know, one of the, the best things that we can do in that time is, yeah, pray for them, but maybe even just send them a message, you know, whether an email or text or call or just say, hey, I'm thinking about you, we're behind you, support you, so on and so forth. You know, that's, you know, kind of relating that to Paul, but even just, you know, in our, in our own lives, you know, as we're just going through our lives, because life, you know, obviously, we all go through difficulties. We all have trials in our lives, you know, and, and we should make sure that we, that when we see a brother or sister going through that, that we reach out to them, let them know that we're there, that they don't have sorrow upon sorrow. So we're just kind of making application as we go through tonight and kind of looking at the overview of, of Philippians before we start to really dig into here, but we see a little bit more here about Epaphroditus. Uh, Paul sends this epistle that we're reading by the hand of Epaphroditus. So he was the one that carried it. You see that Philippians chapter 2, verse 28. I sent him therefore the more carefully that when you see him again, you may rejoice that I may be the less sorrowful. So again, there it is again, speaking to this, this concern that they all had one for another. Oh, the, the Philippians are upset that Epaphroditus was sick and Epaphroditus is sick or so, sorrowful that they found out he was sick and Paul's sorrowful over the fact that they're both sorrowful. Right? That's what's kind of going on here. He's saying, he said that when you see him again, you may rejoice that I may be less sorrowful. 
Receive him, therefore, it says in verse 29, in the Lord with all gladness and hold such in reputation, because for the work of Christ he was nigh unto death, not regarding his life to supply your lack of service towards me. So that's one of the reasons we see here for Paul's writing, is this, there's this mutual concern between the Epaphroditus uh, and the Philippians. He sends this epistle by his hand. And of course, you know, it wasn't just a, hey, everything's okay. It wasn't just a Hallmark card. Don't worry about Epaphroditus. You know, he's here. Don't worry about me. There's a lot of great doctrine in here. But this is one of the reasons why Paul wrote this epistle, because of this relationship with Epaphroditus. That's why he sought to send him more carefully, right? Uh, another reason that Paul went ahead and wrote this epistle, I believe, is because he wanted to assure the Philippians that his own ministry would continue. And that's because they had heard, right, of his conflict, that he had been in jail. And, you know, when we see uh, something like that happen, the tendency might be to think, well, I guess it's over for Paul. You know, Paul had a good run, but this is the end of the road for him, you know, and that concerned them. And rightfully so. You know, we wouldn't want to see, uh, you know, we never want to see a, a man of God, a great ministry or a man of God, his ministry come to an end. We always want to see that continue and go forward. And uh, Paul here, you know, it, it stands to reason that someone would think that. I mean, uh, humanly speaking, he's in jail. You would think the Philippians would, would know a little bit better because of what happened when he was there, you know, 20 years pre previous in Acts chapter 16 when he was miraculously freed from the prison and, and, and brought out of the city by the magistrates, but a little bit of a different situation here. So he writes them not only because of Epaphroditus and their, and their relationship, but also to assure the Philippians that his ministry would continue. Philippians chapter 1 says in verse 23, For I am in a strait betwixt two, having a desire to part and to be with Christ, which is far better. Nevertheless, to abide in the flesh is for, more needful for you. And having this confidence, I know that I shall abide and continue with you all for the furtherance and joy of the faith, that your rejoicing may be more abundant in Jesus Christ for me by my coming to you again. So Paul's speaking very confidently. Not only is my ministry going to continue, but I'm actually going to come to you again. Right? This is the confidence that he has. So he's writing to reassure the Philippian people, don't worry, I'm in jail, but I have the confidence, you will see me again. Okay? And not only that, but Paul also reminds them that his trial, his difficult circumstance is actually to the furtherance of the gospel that he doesn't want them worrying, but to understand that all things work together to good for them that love God, to them that are called according to his purposes. It says in Philippians chapter 1, verse 12, But I would have you under, should understand, brethren, that the things which have happened unto me have fallen out far, rather unto the furtherance of the gospel. <clears throat> you know, and that's something we should always keep in mind whenever we see uh, brethren going through uh, persecution or going through a hard time. Uh, you know, is that the, the word of God is being preached, that that is actually a good thing. Um, of course, you know, every, it's probably coming to everybody's mind, everything that First Works Baptist Church in El Monte, California went through with uh, the bombing and the protests and everything like that. You know, we could look at that and we could worry about it and say, oh no, what's going to happen here? But then we have to, now we can step back and say, well, but look how the, the gospel, the, the message of Christ was spread even further. You know, and I remember when that was going on, I was told that uh, what was said uh, was that you don't get to have your message go out there without paying the price. And, I mean, look at the message that Paul sp spread. I mean, he, he preached to the ends of the earth. I mean, his message went out, you know, all over. <laughs> I mean, we're still reading it today. We're still sitting here reading his exact words. But you don't get to do that without paying the price. There's a price to be paid for the, the one that would deliver that message. So he's just reminding him of that. Hey, the things that have fallen out unto me are to the furtherance of the gospel. And we even see that he's even now preaching to those that are of Caesar's household, right? So that's one of the other reasons that Paul wrote, not just for the relationship and the concern over Epaphroditus, but also because of the fact that the, he wanted to assure the Philippians that his ministry was going to continue. This wasn't the end of the road for him. But he also wrote, you know, just briefly here, a few other things concerning the unity that was in the church, right? And you can see that in Philippians 2, but we read here in Philippians chapter 4, verse 2, it says, I beseech Yodius and Syntyche that they be of the same mind in the Lord. So uh, these two ladies, you know, were buttonheads in the church, and he's saying, hey, I, I want you to be of the same mind, you know, and to, uh, uh, to esteem one better than the other. He wanted, you know, them to bear the axe, you know, or bear the hatchet, I guess the saying is, right? 
And he says in verse 3, And I treat thee also, true yoke, true yoke fellow, help those women which labored me with me in the gospel, with Clement also, and with other my fellow laborers whose names are in the book of life. So, you know, a lot of great doctrine right there. You know, I don't want to dive into all this because we're just kind of doing an overview. But, uh, you know, he is writing because of the unity of the church. But we also see that, you know, women play a very important role in the local church. You know, we kind of get the rap of, uh, you know, just trying to, being misogynistic and so on and so forth. But what we see with Paul here is that there are women that labor with him in the gospel, right? They might not be doing the preaching and the teaching, but they're doing that very important work of preaching the gospel. You know, and I know, I know plenty of, of great women of God over the years that, that are some of the best soul winners I know are women. I'll just be, be perfectly honest. Uh, they really are. And, uh, you know, that's a powerful thing, you know. You think, oh, and you think, oh, this is where it's all at. If you're not behind the pulpit, it's, you're a nobody. That's not the case at all. That's not the case at all. With Paul here, he's saying, look, you need to entreat uh, the also true yoke fellow, help those women which labored with me in the gospel. And with Clement also. So we see real quick here, another reason why he's writing is concerning the unity in church. You know, that was, you know, and again, I just kind of went off a little rabbit trail there. It's a great doctrine though, right? And he's saying here, beseech Yodius and Syntyche that they be in the same mind. So we can see, and if you look at uh, Philippians chapter 2, it talks about he wants them to be, uh, you know, to, 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 uh, that they let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not everyone on his own things, but also on the things of others. So, you know, he's addressing, maybe there's this little bit of disunity in the church, right? And he's addressing that. And then very briefly, Philippians chapter 3, if you would go there, great passage. He talks about, Judaism. There's a, a brief warning here. So we're just looking at why did Paul write this epistle? We're going to spend all this time reading what he wrote and, and dissecting it and learning from it. You know, maybe we should know a little bit about the people that were there, a little bit about the place that those people lived. Maybe we should know a little bit about why Paul even felt like writing this epistle. And one of the other reasons he did that was because of Judaism. He gives us brief warning concerning Judaism. It says in Philippians chapter 3, verse 2, beware of dogs. He's not talking about literal dogs, although that is good advice. Beware of the literal dog as well. <laughs> we went out to breakfast today. I got to tell a story. And this little, it wasn't little, was it? It was a kind of a bigger dog, but he was trotting around, and, and we were at this place getting breakfast, and there's a lot of construction going on right there, and I thought, well, this must be, I had gone ahead and to say, hey, I've got a family. Can you see us? So on and so forth. My wife is getting ready. And this dog's there, and he, I could tell right away he's friendly, but uh, uh, I don't know why I'm telling the story, but I'm, I started and I got to finish it. And this time, I'm like, okay. So I go, I get the family and little Corbin, he just sees Corbin, <laughs> goes over and just plows him right over. And I'm thinking, is this one of the, constru we thought it was a constru one of these construction guys dogs. You know, sometimes guys go to the job site, they bring their dog. So I'm thinking, I can't kick this dog in front of a bunch of construction guys. So I'm, I might get kicked next, you know. <laughs> Because he knocked him right over. He's licking his face, and I pull him off. Everyone, we walk here in the restaurants, just like, I saw one guy ready to pounce, and he was ready to get up, and get, he had my back. But I don't know what that had to do with anything. <laughs> I don't even know why I brought that up, but I did. Uh, anyway, oh, beware of dogs, right? Good advice, you know, if you see that sign, beware of the dog, right? And he's talking about reprobates. He's talking about, uh, you know, without our dogs, right? Beware of dogs, beware of evil workers, beware of the concision. So this is all reference to Judaism, because concision or circumcision, that is something that they practiced, right? Verse 3, for we are the circumcision which worship the God in the spirit, and rejoice in Christ Jesus, and have no confidence in the flesh. Brethren, be followers together of me, and mark them which also walk, this is verse 17, as ye also have an example. And he goes on, right, giving that warning, talking about how they... Uh, you know, they are the enemies of the cross of Christ. Very, you know, that's not something you want to be labeled. That's a very hard thing. Whose end is destruction, verse 19. So these are just some of the reasons why Paul wrote this epistle at all. He wanted to, concerning Epaphroditus and their mutual care one for another, concerning uh, the fact that his ministry is going to continue, he's trying to reassure them. Really, that's what this is all about, is Paul's trying to reassure them about Epaphroditus, reassure them about his own ministry, and then, you know, kind of admonishes unity and gives a brief warning about Judaism. These are some of the things that he included. And, you know, I want to, you know, of course, we're just doing an overview, but I, I don't want to go through without making some application in this. We should definitely learn something from this. 
and one that we should care about one another. You know, we should care about one another, and we should also work toward unity. Right? That is something we always strive to maintain in the local church is unity. You know, if the church starts to go in different directions, we're not going to be able to get everything done that we can get done. So I mean, that's something we always want to strive for, and we should should care for one another. But we also have to understand this, that no church is perfect, right? We would look at the Philippian church on a whole and say, this is a really good church. I mean, they're, Paul's bragging on them about their love. Paul's bragging about their giving, about their work. We saw everything in Acts 16 that they did. Great church, right? Uh, a, really a model church. I mean, not so much like the Corinthians. We look at 1 Corinthians and say, there's a lot of things we shouldn't do. You know, <laughs> you can learn a lot of things that you shouldn't do from the, first, from the Corinthian church. You know, uh, and, and some good, of course, right? Because, again, no church was perfect. The Philippians, we'd say, wow, what a great church. But they even had their issues, didn't they? They even had to work on unity, even, even, even as loving as they were. You, it's kind of surprising when you read about how they're, they're concerned that Epaphroditus is, is sick. And Epaphroditus, one of their own, is concerned that they're concerned that he was sick. And there's this, there's, you can feel that, uh, you know, the love right there. You can feel the love, right? But... Uh, they weren't perfect in this area. And no church is. That's why something unity, we strive to keep unity. We strive for that. We work towards that end. Meaning sometimes we have to back up and say, whoops, I made a mistake here, or I'm not working to that end. Let me correct this, right? No church is perfect, no per and no church is immune either from this. That's one thing we can learn about the Philippian church. And that, you know, uh, and even in a church like... Uh, Philippians, you know, the Philippian church, you know, they have to be united and they have to be vigilant, right? Even when, and, and all the more so, when you're a church that's getting something done for God, you have to stay vigilant. You have to stay vigilant. You have to be aware of the dogs. You have to be aware of the evil workers, so on and so forth. Because when a church is doing great things for God, that's the church that the devil's going to target. That's the church that God, or that the devil, I hope I said that right. Did I just get that all backwards? That's the church that the devil is going to target. He's going to go after that church that is actually trying to get something done for God. And that was the Philippian church, wasn't it? I mean, they were, they were getting something done for God. Big things. But, you know, and Paul was warning them, look out. Look out for, you know, a lack of unity. Look out for people who want to creep in and bring in false doctrine. So they need to be united. They need to be vigilant. That's why Paul's writing to them, to remind them of these things. So that's kind of the purpose behind Paul's writing uh, to the Philippian church, but I also want to look tonight real quick at kind of, we're again just doing an overview of the book tonight. Uh, what's the theme of the book? What's the theme of the book of Philippians? Well, if you've read through it, you're probably going to notice even the few passages we've turned to tonight, there's been a lot of talk about joy and rejoicing, right? And that is the theme of this book, is that it's a book about joy. It's specifically about joy in the Lord. And this is an important point. This is something that we as Christians have to understand. In fact, I would say, you know, Philippians chapter 4, verse 4 is probably the most famous verse in the whole book, right? Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. You know, there's even a little chorus that people sing. You know, I'm not going to sing it, but, <laughs> right, it's that famous. Everyone knows that verse, rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. So that's what Paul's really driving through here. That kind of backs up the purpose for why he even wrote the book, to reassure them that their joy would continue, right? That they wouldn't be overly concerned about Epaphroditus or himself, but that they would be vigilant, that they would stay united, and they would continue to have that joy in the Lord. I mean, let's just look real quick. Go over to Philippians chapter 1. You could try and keep up with me through this, but I'm just going to read several verses. And we're just going to look at several verses here to see that the theme of this book is about joy, and specifically joy in the Lord. It says in Philippians chapter 1, verse 4, Always in every prayer of mine for you all making request with joy. Verse 18, what then, notwithstanding every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is preached, and therein I do rejoice, yea, and will rejoice. Verse 25, and having this confidence, I know that I shall abide with you, or excuse me, and continue with you all for the furtherance and joy of faith. Verse 26, that your, uh, that your rejoicing may be more abundant in Jesus Christ for, uh, for me by coming, me, my coming to you again. Chapter 2, verse 2, fulfill ye my joy, that ye be all like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Verse 16, holding forth the word of life, that I may rejoice in the day of Christ, and have not run in vain, neither labored in vain. Verse 17, 
And if I be offered upon the sacrifice and the service of your faith, I joy and rejoice with you all. For the same cause ye also do joy and rejoice with me. Verse 28, I sent him therefore the more carefully that when you see him again, ye may rejoice and that I may be the less sorrowful. Verse, uh, chapter 3, verse 1, Finally, my brethren, re, uh, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things to you, uh, me, to you, to me indeed, is not grievous, but for you it is safe. Verse 3, For we are the circumcision which words of God in the Spirit, and rejoice in Christ Jesus, and have no confidence in the flesh. Chapter 4, verse 1, Therefore, my brethren, dearly beloved, and long for my joy and crown, so stand ye fast, my dearly beloved. Verse 4, Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Verse 10, But I rejoice in the Lord greatly, and that now at the last your uh, care of me hath flourished again. See how many times that word's coming up? I mean, over, I, I've lost count, but it's, it's probably close to 20 times. Rejoice, joy, rejoice, joy. This is the theme of the book. And you say, well, okay, what's the big deal about that? Consider where Paul's writing from. You have to consider where Paul's writing from. And this is the point I want to make tonight. Paul's writing this from prison. Paul's writing a group of people that are free to, to go about their lives, and he's reminding that he is reminding them to rejoice. He's in prison. And we need to understand this because here's the thing about the Christian life. All they that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. You know, we say that ad nauseum, right? But this is a fact of the Christian life. It's a fact. That tribulation, if you're going to live godly in Christ Jesus, is guaranteed. It's guaranteed. Ask Paul. You know, ask many, 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 many other saints down through the ages. Ask Jesus Christ himself. It's guaranteed, and it's how you handle it is what matters. And that's what we see with Paul. That's the point I, I want to make tonight is that tribulation is guaranteed. Paul knew it. He was writing this from prison. It's how you handle it that matters. Some people, tribulation comes to their life, they throw in the towel. That's it. Ain't worth it. This is depressing. I don't need this, and they're done. Other people take it. They go through it. They understand it. They embrace it. And you know what those people have? They have joy, and they rejoice. I mean, that's what Paul's doing here. And this is a fact of the Christian life. We're going to turn to several passages real quick. Just keep up with me if you want to go over to Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5. The Bible says in Luke 6, this is Jesus speaking, Blessed are you, and men shall hate you, and they shall separate you from their company, and shall reproach you, and cast out your name as evil for the Son of Man's sake. What did he say? Boo-hoo in that day. Feel sorry for yourself. Walk around with a frowny face. You know, get, get all sad about it. No, he said rejoice in that day. Rejoice when? When men are going to separate from me? When men are going to cast out my name as evil? He's saying that's the day to rejoice. Why? And leap for joy. For behold, your reward is great in heaven. That's why. Paul's writing this from prison going, man, I, I'm just, he's just hearing that, you know, that cha-ching, cha-ching up in heaven. Every day he's in prison, every minute he's there, every time he takes a beating, every time he goes through something for the Lord, he's just thinking about what's in heaven waiting for him. And that gives him, that allows him to endure, not only endure it, but to rejoice over it, to leap for joy, the Bible says. You're in Romans 5, he said, it's Paul writing in verse 3, and not only so, but we glory in tribulations also. Oh, do we all do that? <laughs> I appreciate the assumption, Paul. <laughs> we glory in tribulations. And he's speaking, of course, you know, including himself. And they do. Knowing that tribulation worketh patience, right? What's, why should you be glad about going through some kind of tribulation in your life? Because it works patience. I remember being out on the, I, when we were doing these res trips, and I'd have people, and, and I remember one person came to me and said, Brother Corbin, you're a very patient man. <laughs> it's like, well, yeah, I'm dealing with adults. It's not that hard. <laughs> You know, but you, when you deal with people, you you know, people, they, you know, when people ask you the same question over and over and, you, you know, or people, whatever, anyone who's dealt with people know that it can be frustrating. And, it, in the, in a, and if you're a good leader, you'll smile and nod and no one will ever even know that you're a little perturbed or annoyed. <laughs> and someone says, well, you're patient. And I'm thinking, well, why, why is that? How did that happen? Because I wasn't only that way. I say, I had kids. <laughs> right? I went through that tribulation, right? Uh, and, and uh, you know, that worked patience in my life, right? And that's something to rejoice over. You know, when we go through some kind of persecution in our life, you know, and you say, well, what's the point of this? Well, it might just make you a more patient person. 
and might make you able to endure hardness like a good soldier. Go to Romans chapter 12. I mean, this isn't an isolated, you know, set of verses here in Philippians chapter 1. This is a common theme with Paul in many of his writings and in many of his epistles. It's a theme of the New Testament that when we go through hard times, we should rejoice in tribulation. He said in John, uh, uh, Jesus said in John 16, These things have I spoken unto you that ye me might have peace. In the world ye shall have tribulation. He said you might. You might have tribulation. No, he said you shall have. And look, at if we're a Christian and we're not having that tribulation, then we have to ask ourselves, are we really living godly in Christ Jesus then? Because the Bible says all they that live godly, not all Christians, not everyone that's saved and believes is going to have tribulation. He said all that live godly in Christ Jesus shall have suffer persecution. And if Jesus said ye shall have tribulation in the world, so if we're not having it as a Christian, we have, the question is, you know, you can ask yourself one of two questions. Is the Bible true? Well, we know it's true. Or is it that I'm not living godly in Christ Jesus? You know, only we can answer that. And he says, but be of good cheer, right? He said, look, you shall have persecution, right? And then what does he say after that? But be of good cheer. Rejoice. I have overcome the world. <clears throat> he said in Romans 12, you there, verse 12? Romans 12, 12. Rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing instant in prayer. There he is again, telling people to rejoice in hope, to be patient in tribulation. Go over to 2 Corinthians 7. 2 Corinthians chapter 7. I'm going to read to 2 Corinthians 1. It says, Who comforteth us in all our tribulation. God comforts us when? In our tribulation. That's something you rejoice over. Is that, you know, when we're, go when we're suffering for Christ's sake, to whatever degree, whether it's friends or family or co-workers or some mob outside our church or whatever, or any of the things that Paul's gone through that we might never experience, or maybe we will, I don't know, but whatever degree we're, we're suffering persecution, we can rejoice in the fact that God will comfort us in that tribulation. That God, you know, that God's not far off. God's not distant in that time. You know, people that go through those things, that's probably when they feel the, most, the closest to the Lord. When, when the Christian life is the realest. When, when, when the things in the Bible really become alive to them is when they go through these things. That's when God will comfort us in all our tribulation that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble. You know, that's part of the, the rejoicing. Hey, I'm going through this. God's with me. And when I get through the other side, I'm going to be help, able to help somebody else go through this tribulation too. And again, life is full of, its, you know, just being a Christian aside, life has its own tribulations just by the nature of life, right? We all go through similar experiences. And when we go through them, if we take it well, we can help others when they go through it. <clears throat> Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 4. 2 Corinthians 7, verse 4, Great is my boldness of speech toward you. Great is my glorying of you. I am filled with comfort. I am exceedingly joyful in all our tribulation. Well, good for you, Paul. <laughs> right? I'm exceedingly joyful, he said. He says, I'm glorying over you. I'm bold, my boldness of speech for you. I am filled with comfort because we're all going through the same tribulation together. <clears throat> and Paul knew how to take it, didn't he? And that's why when we get to a book like Philippians where he's writing people who are free from prison, joy becomes the theme, right? Now, how is that? How does Paul, how is he able to do that? Because here's the thing, here's what people have to understand. Joy and happiness are not the same thing. <laughs> joy and happiness are not the same thing. Look, lots of things make us happy. Very simple things make us happy, don't they? The tub of ice cream. You might think you're rejoicing. You're just happy. Okay, and you're going to eat that, and you're going to be happy while you eat it, and then after you're, gonna, you're not going to feel so good. <laughs> you keep it up, eventually you're not going to be looking so good, <laughs> and then you're not going to be rejoicing, right? You're not going to be happy, right? But rejoicing, you know, is something different. You know, rejoicing and, and joy are things that are lasting. I think those are the fruits of the spirit, right? Those are the type of things that help us get through tough times, right? Happiness is just something that just comes and goes and it's frivolous, and, and people get happy about the simplest things, right? But joy is something that is long-lasting, that isn't dependent upon circumstance. It's something that is dependent on, it's, it's, it's a mindset. 
It's a way of looking at life, a way of looking at eternity. It's, it comes from a spiritual understanding of how the world really is and what our role in it is and our position in Christ and all of these things. And when we have a deeper understanding of the things of God, that's when we have real joy. And that's the type of thing, that's why Paul is able to go say things like, hey, I'm exceedingly joyful in all our tribulation. That's why Jesus is able to tell us to leap for joy when men persecute us. <clears throat> because they understood that joy and happiness are not the same thing. And we should never confuse the two. You, you know, you might not be happy, you might be sad about something, but you can still have joy. You, you know, and that joy will help us get through those tough times. That rejoicing <clears throat> will help us get through that. We can always find... You know, that, that's the ability to find the silver lining, right? And I heard it said recently, I can't remember where, but somebody said, uh, you know, everything has a silver lining in the Christian life. All the Christian life is is one giant silver lining. You know, that's important to keep in mind. You know, and, and this, this, that's what this last year, you know, has taught me anything, is, is learn to see the silver lining because, you know, the world's going to do whatever the world's going to do. You know, and it's out of our control. Right, and it can, we can get upset and mad about it, and I and I understand all that, but you know what they're not going to do? I don't care what they do; they're not going to steal my joy. They cannot take that from me. Now they might make me unhappy. In fact, they might even make me mad. Right? They might even make me upset when I when I have to when I get out of the car and I go, stupid mask, <laughs> where I didn't bring it off, put the shirt up. Right? That's what's great about ties: just wrap it around, you're good. Right? It might even make me mad, but you know what they're never going to be able to do? Is steal my joy in Christ. <clears throat> and I'll be able to endure whatever they throw at me. You know, hopefully. You know, if we have a walk with God. That's what Paul had. I mean, he was, look at everything Paul went through. And he never lost his joy. In fact, he was exceedingly joyful in all our tribulation, right? So that's kind of, uh, you know, uh, the application here of point one and, or our first point, And we're just kind of looking at... Um, you know, the reasons why Paul wrote this epistle. Lastly, I'm going to close very quickly. I know I'm going a little over here, but, uh, you know, we looked at the theme of joy in the book, but, you know, the, ultimately the theme of every book, you know, obviously there is a theme of joy here, but the theme of every book in the Bible, the whole theme of the Bible itself is Jesus Christ. Everything points towards him all the time. He's in every chapter, every verse, every line, Christ is there. Everything is about him, right? And that's what I'll, I'm going to close with this thought. Go to Philippians chapter 3. You know, if we wanted just to give a quick uh, uh, outline of Philippians from Paul's perspective, Paul's perspective as, as a type of outline in the book of Philippians, you know, one of the things we would see is that Paul's purpose, his purpose was Christ. He said in Philippians 1, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. He said, look, if I'm going to stick around, if I have to be here, then I'm going to minister for Christ, I'm going to live for God, and I'm going to earn rewards in heaven, I'm going to endure all things for the elect's sake. That was Paul's purpose in life, right, that was in Christ. And that's what you see in Philippians chapter 1. Chapter 2, you know, and just again, an outline from Paul's perspective is that, you know, his pattern of living is Christ, the way he conducted himself. Because Christ was his purpose, obviously it only stands, it stands to reason that there would then be a behavior that follows. Look, we cannot say that Christ is our life if our life does not show it. If, if we say, you know, I, for me to live is Christ and die is gain, okay, when we like the to die is gain part, right? I die for Christ. But are you, you know, I only believe that in so much as far as you're willing to live for him. <clears throat> that was his pattern of living. Let this mind be in you, he said in Philippians 2, which also was in Christ Jesus. Had the same mind that Christ had to do God's will. You're in Philippians chapter 3. We see, first of all, his purpose was Christ. His pattern was Christ. His pattern of living was, was centered on Christ. The pursuit of Paul's life was Christ. That's what he pursued with his life, was Christ. Philippians chapter 3, verse 8. Yea, doubtless, I count all things but loss, for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord. That's a bold statement, especially when you consider the pedigree that Paul had in the Jewish faith, in, in Judaism. He said, I count it all loss. You know, I count it a waste of time because it was not focused on Christ. <clears throat> that was his pursuit in life. That's what mattered to him. 
he says, and uh, it goes on and says, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things. Now, now when he's saying suffered there, he's not saying like a pity party. Like, oh, I gave up so much for Jesus. He's saying, you know what? I suffered it. I put up with it. I said, that's fine with me. Like we are to suffer the little children, Jesus said, you know, allow them, accept it. He's saying, look, I accept the loss of all things. I count all things but dung, right? All things but loss. He says, and do count them but dung that I may win Christ. That was his pursuit. That was, Christ was his pursuit. Christ was his pattern of living. Christ was his purpose. And you say, well, that sounds great, but it's really hard to do, and it is. You know, it's, it's you know, how did Paul accomplish all this? Did he do it just in the will of his own flesh? He's just, you know, he just toughed it out? No. Lastly, in, in chapter 4, go to verse 11. We see that his power was found in Christ. His power was there too. He said in verse 11, Not that I speak a, speak a respect of want, for I have learned. And I want to draw attention to that word there. Learned. I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be, uh, therewith, I am therewith to be content. I have learned whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. He learned that. You know, contentment is not something that is just automatic in the Christian life. You didn't just get saved and, and all of a sudden the things of God are the most appealing things to you. And the things of the world are, are not. You know, the flesh is still there. The lust of the, the eyes and the pride of life and all that, it's still there. The old man hasn't gone anywhere. And Paul's saying, like, I learned to be content. <clears throat> he said in verse 12, I know both how to be abased and how to, be, how to abound. And everywhere in all things, I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and suffer need. And then he says, of course, the famous verse in verse 13, I can do all things through Christ. You know, he couldn't do it without Christ. Christ was his power. Yes, Christ was his purpose. Yes, it was his pattern. Yes, it was his pursuit. But none of that would have been possible if Christ had not first been his power. He can do all these things through Christ. And of course, that's a very uh, misquoted verse today, isn't it? A lot of people like to quote that verse completely out of context, thinking, you know, all the, all the, uh, you know, the big sports stars and things like that. And they tattoo this on themselves. Like, you know, I'm a Christian professional sports player. And they put Philippians 4.13 somewhere. And they have no idea what that even means. <laughs> it's not so you can deadlift. <laughs> you know, that's not the power he's talking about here. So you can run a, a race and win or, or, or compete in some tournament. That's not what the power of Christ is for. But they love to put that stuff on there and quote these type of things, don't they? What is the power that, what, what is it that, that empowered Christ or empowered Paul? What did the power of Christ empower him to do? To be content? To be abased. I mean, is that what these guys are doing? Being content? No. Where's my multi-million dollar contract? Well, I thought you could do all things through Christ. I thought, I, I, obviously, I thought that meant you must be a content person. You're willing to be abased. Eh. That's, what Christ, that's what Paul used the power of Christ for. To keep Christ the center of his life, even if it cost him everything. He's willing to count it all dung suffer the loss of all things, that he might know him and the power of his resurrection. So, the, you know, we see, you know, Philippians is a book about joy. And, and we have to understand that, that uh, joy is not happiness. Joy is something that carries us through the Christian life. Rejoicing is something that we can do in tribulation and through tribulations. And Paul, was a, as we see here, is, is someone that has true joy in his life. I mean, if you're writing us from prison, you think he's faking it, folks? <laughs> he's really got it. I mean, the, when he was, in, you know, in Acts 16, after getting, he's there with Silas after getting whipped. They're in, 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 in the prison, the innermost part, you know, part of the prison, singing hymns in the middle of the night. They weren't expecting an earthquake. They weren't, like, counting down. They just like, hey, well. Then they, when, they, when the apostles got beat, in Acts chapter 2, they went away rejoicing. You know, they, they, they had been counted worthy to suffer for his name. <clears throat> you say, well, I want that kind of joy. Well, then you have to have the priorities that Paul had. You have to have the priorities. And what are those priorities? Well, first of all, it's Jesus, right? Jesus. 
He said, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is preached. He said, I don't care what I go through. I don't care if they preach Christ of goodwill or of contention. Christ is preached. Jesus is first. And then others, right? J-O, right? Jesus, others. That your rejoicing, he told the Philippians, may be more abundant in Jesus Christ. He was more concerned about them. He said, I have a desire to part and be with Christ, which is far better. Nevertheless, it's more needful for you than I abide. He said, I'll stick around for other people. He was more than willing to go. More than willing to go. And then yourself, right? We come last. That we esteem the things, uh, we, you know, we, we look not upon our own, on, on our own needs, but also the things of others, right? That's the mind that was in Christ Jesus. And that is the key to true joy in the Christian life. And if we don't have it, maybe it's because our priorities are out of whack. It, the, we're putting the Y before the J, right? It's us, and then maybe others, maybe, you know, Jesus got to come first. And then after him, then other people, and then ourselves. And we, you know, joy, here's the thing. This type of rejoicing, it's there for us. And it's sad when, not, when, we, when, when we see Christians that don't know it. And they, and they live, it'd be sad to live your whole Christian life and never really know the joy of the Lord through contentment, through having the right priorities, the real joy that is there that can is be found in just simply reading his word, being content with you know, whatever state you're in, caring about the things of God, caring things about the things of Christ, making that your priority in life. It'd be sad to, to miss out on that in the Christian life, but people do. It's theirs to be had, but we just have to remember that God, as I was told once, God would have you holy rather than have you happy. And that ought to be our, our, our motto. If, my, if it comes down to a decision between, well, I can either be holy or I can either be happy. Choose holy. Because eventually holy is going to bring rejoicing. It's going to bring real joy. Happiness is just fleeting. Let's go ahead and pray.